Make sure you never miss an FX Medicine episode by subscribing to us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. Hi, and welcome to FX Medicine, where we bring you the latest in evidence-based, integrative, functional, and complementary medicine. FX Medicine acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, where we live and work, and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Dr. Georgia Ede is an internationally recognised Harvard-trained psychiatrist specialising in nutrition science and brain metabolism. She has 25 years of clinical experience working with people experiencing a range of psychiatric conditions, where she offers nutrition-based approaches as an alternative to psychiatric medications. She developed the first medically accredited course in ketogenic diets for mental health practitioners co-authored the first inpatient study of the ketogenic diet for treatment-resistant mental illness, and has recently published the book, Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind. So welcome to FX Medicine, Dr. Reid. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really interested, I suppose, uh, you know, you trained originally, you trained as a psychiatrist and now specialise in nutritional interventions for people experiencing a range of mental health conditions. Now, that's certainly not typical for a psychiatrist. So can you tell me a bit about how you got into nutrition rather than kind of medication as a first-line treatment? Well, yes, I I practiced conventionally for the first 10 years of of my clinical work, my clinical years, you know, medications and psychotherapy. Uh, And honestly, the relationship between nutrition and mental health didn't cross my mind once. I had absolutely no no training in that. We didn't discuss food in the brain in four years of medical school and four years of residency. It just never came up. And Mm -hmm. so uh, it wasn't until I was experiencing some of my own health issues that were cropping up in my early 40s and, you know, decided to try some uh, changes to my own diet to see if I could help myself with some of those issues that were arising, things like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and migraines and IBS and things that a lot of my middle-aged patients were were complaining to me about and I had no idea how to help them with. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so I was was doing some trial and error, trial and error changes to my own diet. And Long story short, after about six months of these trial and error changes and keeping a food and symptom journal, I I was able to reverse all of these issues that I was having um, uh, by essentially turning my diet almost completely upside down from what we're told to eat. And and that was one thing because you know, I was trying to address some physical issues. But what surprised me and got my attention as a psychiatrist was that these changes had a very noticeable effect on my own mental health, which I wasn't even Mm -hmm. trying to, (laughs) wasn't even trying to accomplish. I hadn't even been aware of any significant issues with my mental health at that point. And so, you know, my mood was better, my mental stamina, my concentration, my sleep, my um, productivity was noticeably improved. And so I thought to myself with this unusual diet, and this was back in, you know, 2008 or 2009, uh, this mm-hmm. unusual diet, which is you know low in fiber and high in animal foods, high in cholesterol, high in fat, low in plant foods, low in carbohydrates, this diet seems to be good for the brain. But I, I really knew nothing about nutrition at that point, and so I was genuinely concerned that the diet was going to be dangerous for me long term, and I didn't want to recommend it to any of my patients. So I thought, I need to study nutrition and, and uh, understand more about about this before I before I even think about introducing this into, into my into my clinical work. And so I started studying nutrition independently and did that really intensively uh, for years before I slowly began incorporating these these principles into my practice. Wow, wow. So I, I suppose, um, you know, certainly you mentioned changing your diet and uh, often the recommendations are, you know, your, your food pyramid, you eat, eat more grains and, and, and plants and so forth, but you're... Your approach is different. It's not necessarily just about, obviously, plants. You've mentioned, um, well, can you tell me a bit about the diet that you potentially you advocate with, with your clients? Sure, and and I and I want to emphasize that the diet I recommend for my clients is not 
that my own personal diet that I've, you know, tailored to my own personal needs is, you know, is not what I recommend to everyone. <laughs> you know, the, mm-hmm. the diet that I, that I write about in the book that took me years to sort out, uh, the, the plans that are in my books, there are several approaches. They're not, I'm not recommending that everybody eat what, you know, exactly the way I do. And so, but, but what, but the principles in the book, I think hold true for everyone. And that's from years of studying and clinical practice and so forth that, um, that have helped me sort that out. And, so as you say, it is very different from from what we are recommended to eat. So for example, there are three big picture strategies in the book that people can use to begin troubleshooting their mental health and trying to understand whether or not the way they're eating might be partly or largely or even entirely responsible for their mental health condition. And so it's really a, kind of a journey of discovery that takes six to 12 weeks and but the first step is is really essentially a moderate carbohydrate paleo diet that's modified in a certain a few unique ways to be gentler. Uh, I call them a quiet a quiet paleo diet, and it's meant it's meant to be gentle gentle and not only on glucose and insulin levels contains about ninety grams of carbohydrate per day as opposed to the at least three hundred grams per day in the typical diet. But it's also, um, you know, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a paleo pattern. So it, it removes grains and legumes and dairy products and modern processed foods and added sugars and alcohol, lots of common culprits um, that can mm-hmm. cause inflammation and oxidative stress and reduce nutrient um, uh, the efficiency by which nutrients are absorbed in the system. So it's and then it has a few other modifications as well. To be gentler on the nervous system, to be gentler on the gut, to be gentler on the immune system. And then the next level, if that's not useful enough, is a ketogenic version of that very same diet. Uh, and so that brings the carbohydrates down to closer to 20 grams, depending on who you are. That can be customized, you know, to your personal metabolic uh, tolerances. And so in a lot of cases, that will be down, you know, to 25, 20 grams per day. So a ketogenic version of that same diet. And then there's a third level, too, of exploration of if those other interventions haven't been helpful enough, which is actually a modified version of a, of a carnivore diet, which is a very low plant or plant-free in, in the case of, of the diet that I'm recommending in the book is a plant-free version of the carnivore diet and is also uniquely modified to be a little gentler on a variety of systems. So uh, these these are meant to be short-term ex- exploratory um, uh, dietary patterns that then can be expanded mm-hmm. as tolerated once you figure out whether or not they're helpful to you. So do you start in a stepwise fashion? Do you start with the paleo, the quiet paleo diet first and then go to the, if that's not sufficient enough to resolve your symptoms, then you go to the keto and then to the carnivore? Is that how it works? Yes, and the reason why I don't uh, ask people to transition immediately from their current diet to a ketogenic diet is because uh, that when you do that, when you go immediately from, say, an average of 300 grams of carbohydrate per day, uh, particularly if a lot of those carbohydrates are refined, like sugars and flours and cereals and so forth, then I, and you, if you plunge yourself immediately onto a ketogenic diet, a squeaky clean ketogenic diet, whole foods, 20 grams of carbohydrate per day, what happens then is you, you have a really steep uh, and abrupt uh, drop in insulin levels, not just okay. glucose levels, but also insulin levels. And that is a that can be a tremendous shock to the brain and the body that can be very uncomfortable. And, and for people who are taking certain medications or who have certain health conditions, it can actually be dangerous. And so uh, this is why I recommend easing, sort of st- in a stepwise fashion, kind of easing your carbohydrate level down so that you ease your, in- you, you gradually lower your insulin levels. It's much more comfortable uh, uh, and, and tolerable. And then you avoid a lot of unnecessary, what are called keto flu symptoms. I mean, there are other, other uh, recommendations in the book to minimize those so called keto flu symptoms to make it more comfortable, that transition. Um, so, but that's, that's why I don't start immediately with a ketogenic diet for everybody. And is that what you mean by the uncomfortable symptoms? Is, is, flu, is it flu-like symptoms that people would experience if they did it too abruptly? 
Yeah, so there's this this um, this term called keto flu, which at least people who are familiar with ketogenic diet during the ketogenic diet community are very. Um, uh, this is sort of a common term for for these transitional from these keto adaptation symptoms, and really what they are is it can be a variety of things. You know, headaches, dizziness, carbohydrate cravings, moodiness, uh, even sleep disruption. Um, that can that, that can occur as the body and brain are seeking their new metabolic equilibrium, and this can mm-hmm. take depending on how healthy and flexible the person's metabolism is. It can take three days to three weeks, or maybe even a little longer, to get through that adaptation period. And so um, now, not everybody needs to uh, you know progress to a ketogenic diet, and, and certainly not everybody's going to want to. And that's another reason why I offer this this uh, the, the, the step one approach as well for, for people. You know, there are quite a few people out there for whom keto is a non-starter. <laughs> and I mm-hmm. want all of those people to, you know, have, I want them to know that there are so many changes that they can make to their diet that could bring them much better mental health, perhaps even, uh, perhaps even bring them complete relief from a mental health condition that uh, without even going to a ketogenic diet in some cases. So uh, I really wanted to make sure that everybody had an option where they could grab on, where they felt comfortable and, 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 and do more if they wanted to. But, uh, if the book were just about ketogenic diets, I think that we'd be missing a lot of people who could benefit from other healthy dietary changes. I mean, certainly the interest, you know, I was similar to yourself. I mean, I started out as a traditional clinical psychologist and uh, then branched out more into integrative and, and nutritional-based approaches too as part of my, my intervention. But typically, I mean, and certainly nutritional psychiatry, I think, is is... I think people are becoming more aware of it and the research is, is accumulating in the area. But typically the recommendations are around Mediterranean diets and, and you know, eating uh, lots of plant-based foods and colours and, and, so, and things like that. But you have reservations about that? that what's, what's, can you tell me a bit about that? Absolutely. So one of the, um, one of the topics that I address, and actually I address both these topics at length in the book, um, but one of the points I make in the book uh, about the Mediterranean diet is that the Mediterranean diet, there's no question that the Mediterranean diet has been shown in study after study after study to be healthier for the brain and for the body uh, than the standard American, so-called standard American or standard Western diet. We, you think we need a new name for it because it's now a global diet. <laughs> so, you know, the, the modern ultra-processed diet uh, that most of us are eating around the world. Uh, so now the Mediterranean diet is healthier than that diet, but A, yep. what diet isn't, <laughs> and B, um, could we do better? And when you actually look at uh, the, the components of the Mediterranean diet, I think there are many reasons to believe um, that although the Mediterranean diet is absolutely healthier than the, than the sort of standard uh, uh, modern global diet, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the healthiest but it's the best diet for the brain or for the body. And when you look at the components, you see lots of reasons to to uh, to question its its superiority to other plants. And the, for example, the the Mediterranean diet, the foundation of the Mediterranean diet is uh, starchy staples, and these are things like whole grains, legumes, uh, but also refined grains, uh, uh, breads and pastas and cereals. Are not are not excluded on the Mediterranean diet. Some of them are even explicitly encouraged. So um, not only is that diet, uh, which is forty to sixty percent carbohydrate, not only is that diet um, too high in carbohydrate for the growing majority of us who now have insulin resistance and can't safely process that amount of carbohydrate anymore, but it's also the the, the foods. The actual foods that form that foundation, they really don't deserve, they haven't earned that place uh, in, in mm-hmm. the human food pyramid because they're very, very low in nutrients unless we fortify them. And they're, beyond that, they're even high in anti-nutrients, you know, things that interfere with uh, our ability to access the nutrients that they do contain. Um, and so uh, it's a very strange choice uh, to be the foundation of, of the human diet. They're primarily a source of starch. And and starch is optional in the human diet. We, the human beings really don't, we don't require any dietary carbohydrate. We certainly can 
nourish ourselves with carbohydrates. We, we don't need to because we can make all of our own glucose inside of our own bodies from protein and fat if we choose to do so. So it's an optional macronutrient to begin with and a dangerous one for a lot of us now who have um, a significant degree of insulin resistance, unfortunately. So, so there are a number of problems there. And then, of course, there's the encouragement of red wine, which is a, certainly not a, not, not a brain-healthy beverage. And, and, you know, the other thing is that the Mediterranean diet, it, it's a very complicated diet. It's very hard for a lot of people to describe. It's kind of vaguely described and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in, in, includes foods which may or may not be necessary, you know, for, for, for human health. And so I think that, you know, yes, it is healthier because it does it includes some healthy animal foods, nutritious animal foods, yeah. and so it's not it's not a vegan or, ve- or even a vegetarian diet. But it um, the diet is a very complicated pattern that's hard for a lot of people to to describe, and so it's mm-hmm. hard to know if some if people are even following it. When when you're looking at studies, how do you know they're actually adhering to it? It's it's difficult when people are studying Mediterranean diet how it's defined. So many reasons to question it. And this is why, you know, for example, when we look at ketogenic diets, there's lots of lots of growing science about ketogenic diets over even the past hundred years or more. About ketogenic diets having kind of unique brain stabilizing properties, brain chemistry stabilizing properties. And so, one of the things that's a quandary for us to sort of wrestle with is how could a ketogenic diet, which is so different from a Mediterranean diet in terms of its, for example, carbohydrate content. How could a Mediterranean diet and a ketogenic diet both be good for the brain? And I think the answer is they both are. They both better. <laughs> they're both better than than the standard American Absolutely. or standard you know global uh, ultra processed foods diet that most of us are eating. Um, so, uh, but if you're not getting enough benefit from a Mediterranean diet, mm-hmm. a ketogenic diet um, makes sense as your next step because it energizes the brain in a completely different way. And it really has a pow- look, unique, uniquely brain healing benefits. That's what that's what we're discovering in in, in the field of, of metabolic psychiatry. Okay, okay. So certainly, Mediterranean diet, diet better than the standard American diet. Um, once you know what it is, because certainly the the we're talking about the more traditional. Mediterranean diet as opposed to the current Mediterranean diet, which is very different to the traditional one, you know, with pizzas and pastas and all that stuff. But uh, but then potentially that's not going to be enough and then result move, you could potentially move into the, the, the more ketogenic diet. Now, you in your book, you talk, a lot, you talk a lot about insulin and blood sugars and, I mean, how does that affect the brain? Because typically insulin and, and blood sugars is, is you know, linked with diabetes rather than kind of brain health. So how does insulin and sugars affect the brain? You know, what I like to tell my patients is, is that if they have prediabetes or diabetes, they don't just have a blood sugar problem, they also have a brain sugar problem. And the reason for that is you know, the brain is, is attached to the rest of the body and it is influenced by our metabolic health, in fact, profoundly. And so what's interesting about the glucose insulin in the brain is that um, the glucose enters the brain quite easily uh, using an insulin-independent transporter. So uh, glucose can cross easily into the brain, essentially no questions asked, and, and the, the, the level of glucose inside the brain is always directly proportional um, um, to to the amount of insulin and, of, of glucose in the blood, it, so it follows a concentration gradient. Um, that's not so with insulin. So insulin, uh, which also needs to cross into the brain, uh, the insulin receptor that carries uh, insulin into the brain, that, that that transport mechanism can become insulin resistant over time. So mm-hmm. as insulin levels are climbing and climbing, and people with uh, worsening insulin resistance over the years. Uh, the more insulin resistant a person is in their periphery, the more difficult it is for insulin to cross into the brain. And this is a serious problem because, because the brain can't turn glucose into energy efficiently or to full capacity or use it for anything else uh, without adequate insulin. So what you can have over time is a brain that's swimming in glucose and still slowly starving to death. Uh, and, and this is called cerebral glucose hypermetabolism, the sluggish brain glucose processing. And this is now 
uh, very, very well established over the, the, the 19, 20 year, 19 or 20 years now, uh, researchers have known that there's not just an association between insulin resistance and Alzheimer's disease, but actually a direct causal relationship between insulin resistance, cerebral glucose hypermetabolism, and the, the neurodegenerative process of, of Alzheimer's disease. So by the time patients notice any memory problems, their glucose processing can already have been slowed by 25%, and the hippocampus can already have shrunk by 10%. And so this is a, this same process of uh, sort of insulin deprivation uh, is and, and glucose uh, glu- glucose hypermetabolism is uh, it, we're learning that this is not just a problem with Alzheimer's, but that we're seeing this a- across a wide variety of common psychiatric conditions, from anxiety disorders to mood disorders uh, to attention disorders, uh, even you know, PTSD, OCD, uh, depression, anxiety. Uh, most psychiatric disorders we now know are at least associated with insulin resistance, if not directly influenced by insulin resistance uh, in a way that uh, that that uh, influences the severity and or course of the condition. So does the insulin resistance, I know there's obviously accumulating research around the relationship between inflammation and mental health and cognitive health. Is, does the insulin resistance also contribute to some of the inflammatory processes that are going on? Oh, that's an interesting question. So there, there are many different things that can cause inflammation in the brain, um, and uh, so, uh, but but the relationship between glucose and insulin metabolism, the metabolic health, uh, in that sense, the glucose and insulin uh, system, and and inflammation is very uh, well established, and it has largely to do with uh, glucose levels being too high in the brain. So uh, remember we were saying that um, there's a direct relationship between the level of glucose in the blood and the level of glucose inside the brain. And so there's always that, uh, it's always proportional to it. So every time a person with insulin resistance or if you have insulin resistance and you eat healthy whole, too many healthy whole food carbohydrates from fruits and starchy vegetables, or if you don't have insulin resistance and you're eating too many of the wrong carbohydrates too often, the refined carbohydrates, what you'll get is an exaggerated glucose spike in the bloodstream, and you will then therefore also, of course, get an exaggerated glucose spike inside the brain. And the brain is Mm -hmm. exquisitely sensitive to excess glucose. In fact, that gradient we were talking about before is very steep. Um, Let's say your blood, it's always 80% lower. The brain glucose is always 80% lower than the blood glucose. And that's on purpose because the brain, the brain can't tolerate, doesn't need much and cannot tolerate too much glucose. And so if there's too much glucose inside the brain, every time you're eating the wrong way or getting the spike, you're getting this brain glucose spike as well. And that, that excess glucose literally sticks, glycates, um, you know, it sticks to proteins and DNA and lipids and other kinds of, you know, other, other important cell components inside the brain and uh, turns them into these advanced glycation end products or EGEs. And these, uh, these um, elicit a, a brain immune response to, uh, you know, a, a, the brain deliberately uh, mounts an inflammatory response to clear away these AGEs so that they won't interfere with cell signaling. So what you get is an inflammatory response, which is quite healthy, first step of the immune response. And then you also get, along with that, uh, a wave of oxidative stress, which is also part of that first phase of the immune response. So you get lots of oxygen-free radicals being released and inflammatory cytokines being released uh, on purpose to to uh, to clear away those AGEs. But then what's supposed to happen, and, and that's what would happen no matter what the insult was to the brain, whether it's injury or infection um, uh, or, or a glucose spike. And so, but then what's supposed to happen, that's supposed to be a temporary controlled reaction. But, mm-hmm. And instead of that, for, for most people around the world now who are eating uh, too many of the wrong carbohydrates, uh, three, four, five, six times a day, refined carbohydrates with every meal and snack, uh, or people who have insulin resistance, which is now a growing majority of people in, in quite a few areas of the world, particularly the Pacific Islands, actually, uh, and the United States, but growing uh, percentages of uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the UK, uh, Europe. What you see now is that um, instead of that temporary controlled, healthy, inflammatory 
uh, an oxidative stress response, you what you see instead is chronic, um, uh, uncontrolled inflammation and oxidative stress that never gets a chance to quiet down, allow healing to take place mm-hmm. because there's a constant wave. These constant waves of of uh, of uh, glycation are occurring. So th- th- this is very damaging to the brain. It can ultimately destabilize neurotransmitter systems and lead to something called glutamate excitotoxicity, which is just mm-hmm. extremely high levels, up to 100 times the normal level of glutamate in the brain. Glutamate is a, the brain's primary excitatory neurotransmitter, the brain's gas pedal, and that's physically directly damaging to um, to just about every um uh, every molecule and, and surface in that, you know, the, the brain's delicate architecture. So, you, you know, this, it's one thing for this to be happening from time to time under, you know, emergency circumstances. It's another thing for it to be happening all day long and well into the night, the way we're eating now. So it's, it's really very, very um, concerning uh, the, the way, you know, the, the relationship between our modern ultra-processed diet and brain health is a very profound and concerning connection. So does it does the insulin resistance um, is it just a result of food or can if somebody is experiencing chronic stress or poor sleep or they uh, are there certain medications that can affect insulin resistance or is it just from food? Absolutely. What a fantastic question. So yes, all of those things do contribute to insulin resistance. Absolutely, poor sleep contributes to insulin resistance. Stress contributes to insulin resistance medications. And of course, unfortunately, many of the most effective um, and uh, 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 psychiatric medications uh, directly contribute and cause insulin resistance, including the antipsychotic medications, uh, medicines like risperidone and olanzapine and, and quetiapine, uh, clozapine, but also um, some of the anticonvulsant mood stabilizers like valproate. And so, uh, and and mirtazapine, one of uh, uh, one of the antidepressants. And so, there are lots of psychiatric medications uh, that can uh, cause this problem, uh, and 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 make and exacerbate this problem. And this is, of course, a, a difficult conundrum for a lot of patients to find themselves in. Anybody out there who prescribes psychiatric medications, which is now most most prescribing professionals, and anybody in the mental health field. Um, I'm sure you yourself have worked with many patients who are taking these medications, and what, what do we usually see? You know, just a tremendous increase in appetite, blood sugar levels, much higher rates of, of, of uh, up to triple the rate of type 2 diabetes in people who take antipsychotic medications. Um, obesity, people can gain dozens of pounds that are almost impossible to shed. And uh, a, a tremendous uh, decrease in not just quality of life, but also length of life due to cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes and all kinds of other health problems that come along with, uh, with, with um, metabolic dysregulation. So a lot of patients find themselves in, between a rock and a hard place. You know, do I want my mental health to improve or do I, you know, do I want my physical health or do I want my mental health? Yep. And uh, so it's a really, really tough situation to be in. And this is one of those situations where a ketogenic diet is just a godsend because, um, and we can talk about this more if you want, but in a study I helped publish in 2022, we showed this, that you know, if you add the ketogenic diet to these psychiatric medications, metabolic health improves across the board despite the fact that they're still on these medications. And so um, it's a wonderful, at least adjunctive treatment, if not uh, you know, alternative treatment for those who, you know, mm-hmm who, who uh, are good candidates for this intervention. So there's a lot of hope here in terms of turning things around. But you know, when people start taking antipsychotic medication, their blood glucose and insulin levels can rise within minutes to hours of the very first dose. Wow. So you've got then the medications that are potentially there to treat uh, the condition, but then put, uh, potentially exacerbate the condition over time and then, uh, and then lead to not only medical conditions that are, you know, increased obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes, but then can also affect the brain. So this is where the ketogenic... So the ketogenic, is is it safe to, to go on a ketogenic diet on these medications? Uh, absolutely. So you know, I, I teach a CME uh, clinician training course in ketogenic diets for mental health. I've been teaching for about four years. And uh, one of the things I teach my clinicians is how to safely uh, 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 combine the ketogenic diet with 
psychiatric medications. And, and there are a few medications where you need to be very careful. Uh, you may need to adjust doses. You may need to check levels. You may need to uh, monitor for, for certain types of special side effects and interactions between the ketogenic diet and certain psychiatric medications. Uh, you know, there's a whole module in the course about that. But the, but the short answer to your question is that the antipsychotics in particular, it is absolutely safe. Um, and even I would I would venture to say may even be a good idea uh, to to add the ketogenic diet to those medications, if nothing else, to help counteract the serious metabolic uh, side effects that those medications um, can 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 cause. And uh, it can be more difficult, you know, for people who are taking those medications to get into ketosis. But um, I've had lots and lots and lots of patients successful at doing that. And once they do do that, once they're able to, you know, cross that um, keto adaptation, you know, is kind of get through that initial keto adaptation phase of several weeks, there are usually tremendous uh, metabolic benefits and, and, and also many cognitive benefits as well. People feel much better. Um, and, you know, a lot of my patients um, don't come to me because they're trying to get off of all of their psychiatric medication. Quite a few of my patients come to me hoping, you know, that to stay on their psychiatric medication, but simply to feel better or lose some of the weight that, that, that they have, you know, gained on the psychiatric medication. Some people are really quite loyal to certain medicines. They've been really, really helpful to them. They don't want to stop them. They just want to feel better on them. And and it's a wonderful uh, option to now have to, to offer all of those patients. Wow. So you've, what about then, you know, potentially if, if sugar's the problem and insulin's the problem and insulin resistance is the problem, why not just put everybody on anti-diabetes medication? Uh, well, no, medication, diabetes medications are an option. So, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not an anti, you know, across the board anti-medication person. I really, uh, A, I think, you know, we need to offer patients a choice and let them decide what they feel is, you know, the, the path that they that they wish to go down. But also there are definitely some cases where people can't change their diets because of, you know, they're in an institutional setting, for example, or there's too much cognitive impairment at that point or um, whatever the situation may be. Or, or they also, you know, um, there are some situations where uh, a ketogenic diet is not going to help enough. Or in some mm-hmm. cases, it may not help at all. And so we need we need alter, we need choices, right? We need, and so I will often use a combination. If someone comes to me who's already taking psychiatric medications, which is most of my patients come to me on at least yep. one psychiatric medication, sometimes two or three or four or five, <laughs> and uh, it's not at all unusual, as you know. Um, uh, the first step is not to take them off their medications, not by any stretch. And, I, and you know, obviously, if there are any any people listening who are taking the psychiatric medications, that is definitely not step one. <laughs> so step one is, um, you know, to to work with somebody or learn more about this diet um, before you start the diet, because there are quite a few safety precautions that you need to be aware of before you, before the diet starts, especially when medications and health issues are concerned. But also, you know. Um, uh, you know, the first step is not to, to change the medications. The first step, nine times out of ten, is going to be to add the diet to the medications, and then mm-hmm. see how things go. And then gradually, uh, let's assume, uh, let's hope that we've got a situation, and it's a very common situation, that the patient improves on a ketogenic diet, and that does happen in a lot of cases. Then, after a sufficient period of adaptation and stability, and kind of reaching a new equilibrium. Uh, then you can start beginning slowly and carefully to taper one medication at a time and see uh, what's possible for that patient in terms of reducing or even eliminating medications um, that they've been that they've been uh, finding helpful over time. Wow. So how effective? I mean, when you're using ketogenic diets with your clients, um, um, are you noticing most people experience benefit from it? What's What's your experience and what's the research say around ketogenic diets and psychiatric disorders? My gosh, it is such an exciting time to, to be a psychiatrist. Um, you know, very little has happened in psychiatry for far too long. And this is really a wonderful, um, I mean, I find it the most powerful and most effective tool I have for helping patients 
um, across a wide range of psychiatric conditions. So in my clinical practice, and I've worked with hundreds of patients over the years using this and other special dietary interventions that I you know, um, go into in more detail in the book, um, uh, in almost everyone, I mean, not everybody, I mean, I, I haven't counted, but I would say, you know, 90%. I mean, it's unusual for me to come across a person who, um, who experiences no benefit from improving the quality of their diet. And so most of us have been feeding our brain improperly our entire life. So when you feed your brain properly, whether you follow a ketogenic diet or not, um, if you're just eating properly, um, there are tremendous benefits possible there. And, you know, you're nourishing the brain uh, completely, uh, which standard diets do not do. You're energizing the, the brain differently uh, and, and more efficiently and more reliably, which modern diets do not do. And you're protecting the brain from uh, the, all of the uh, very damaging ingredients of the modern ultra-processed diet, particularly the refined carbohydrates and the vegetable oils. And so how could you not, <laughs> not feel better? But, the, but you know, the, most of my patients do experience a significant and meaningful degree of improvement. And quite a few of my patients are able to reduce either the dosage of the medications they're taking or the number of the medications they're taking. And some are able to not need to, uh, they're able to avoid starting medication in the first place. And some are able to come completely off all of their psychiatric medications. And then the research, um, so I helped to publish a study in 2022, uh, the work of my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Albert Dunant in Toulouse, France, psychiatrist like in practice for now more than 35 years, a wonderful guy. Um, he invited 31 of his most treatment resistant patients with serious chronic mental illnesses, treatment resistant, depression, major depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder, um, these folks were taking an average of five psychiatric medications at the time. These folks had all been hospitalized one or more times in the past, most of them under his supervision. These people had been in treatment for an average of 10 years, some for as long as 30 years, most of them under his care for all that time and had never experienced a remission. And they came into the hospital voluntarily to try a simple, mildly ketogenic, whole foods diet in the hospital under his supervision. And 28 of those 31 patients were able to stay on the diet for two weeks or longer, which is what you need to do to start to see benefits. And every single one of those patients improved, both psychiatrically and metabolically, 43% wow. of them achieved clinical remission from their primary psychiatric diagnosis, and 64% left the hospital on less psychiatric medication. And so what that tells me, this is not a randomized control trial, I need to point that out, but what this tells me is that there's tremendous hope even for people who think they've tried everything, who haven't responded to anything. Who, who've been ill for many years, even with very serious mental illnesses, no matter how many medicines they were taking, no matter what the diagnosis was, it didn't seem to matter. People responded and responded robustly at a level that was six to 10 times better uh, in terms of the what's called Cohen's D effect size, six to times, 10 times more robustly than we see in mm -hmm. antidepressant and antipsychotic medication trials. Wow. And so was there particular conditions that kind of works better for or faster for? Or is it, you know, when, you, are you, when you're talking about remission, are you, are you talking about remission in people with schizophrenia? Indeed, indeed. And there's absolutely, and this, I, know, I, know it sounds, I know it sounds incredible, but this is what's happening. It's not just in this study. It's in my own patient population. It's in documented, beautifully documented case reports uh, in the scientific literature. Um, it's it's in patient testimonials, uh, which are now, of course, do, thanks to social media, uh, easy for people to access. You know, listen to people's stories. Which and and uh, there's a wonderful website I, I might recommend to folks if they're curious to learn more about the science and and uh, uh, not just the science, but also the family and patient experiences and the research and and the clinical work that that lots of us are are doing in this space. And that website is called metabolicmind.org. It's a lovely uh, home for all of these, uh, for all of this uh, information. 
and it's funded by and sort of um, uh, set up by a philanthropic organization called the Bazuki Brain Research Fund. And that fund was started by Jan Ellison Bazuki and her husband David Bazuki after their son, Matt Bazuki, uh, put his uh, very serious uh, bipolar disorder with psychotic features, which had you know, uh, interrupted his college career and had him homeless for a time on the streets um, into complete sustained remission about three years ago, and he's completely well. Wow. So, and wow. there are many, many stories like this. All right, we'll certainly put a link to that uh, website in our show notes for sure. So, so in terms of ketogenic diets, then basically depression, you've mentioned schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, what about PTSD, ADHD? Would it help people experiencing those conditions too? So theoretically, yes, and in my clinical experience, yes, but we don't have any studies yet on PTSD or ADHD. Those studies are in the works. There are studies mm-hmm. now being funded and being started up around the world uh, at, at many prestigious institutions around the world. Um, the, the research in this area is suddenly exploding. And with good reason, there's tremendous potential uh, in this field. Uh, one of the uh, most, one of the most exciting places this is happening. One of the most exciting uh, types of research going on in this area is at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Dr. Ian Campbell, who put his own bipolar disorder into full sustained remission more than seven years ago using a ketogenic diet, is now one of the world's leading researchers in this area, and he's conducted um, some beautiful uh, uh, and published some beautiful pilot data on uh, ketogenic diets in bipolar disorder, and is. Um, on the brink of starting a, a randomized controlled trial in the field. And uh, there, there's all kinds of research going on in this area now. So I think um, uh, because this diet is not, a, it's not really a diet. It, I mean, you had asked earlier about plant-based diets, and I hadn't gotten around to, to answering you about that. I want people to know, because you know, a lot of people think of the ketogenic diet as a high meat diet, and it doesn't need to be. The, the ketogenic diet is not, a food list. It's not a dietary pattern. It's a, it's a metabolic state of mind. It's a metabolic intervention and a quite powerful one. And you can get into ketosis uh, whether you eat plants, animals, or both. It's not about plants and animals. It's about mm-hmm. your macronutrient ratio. It's about switching okay. the primary source of fuel in your brain from a carbohydrate to fat. And when you do that, um, the brain is energized in a much more stable, more reliable, more efficient way with, and with uh, much less inflammation, much less oxidative stress. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a uniquely healing metabolic state that anyone, regardless of your dietary preferences, can, can benefit from. Is it difficult to stick to? I suppose the, the issue for me is that working with you know, many patients over the years that um, – you know, obviously, re- you know, there's numerous behavioural recommendations, lifestyle recommendations that you know we regularly make to our, our clients, and uh, some of them they implement and they're able to kind of continue with, and others they struggle with. And diet is one of those that some people do really well with, and other people really struggle with making those changes. So, you know, particularly if you've got somebody with schizophrenia or somebody with bipolar who's experiencing your know, you, you manics and your depressive episodes, are, are they able to? Stick to the diets? Is it difficult? How do you work with such patients? Well, uh, I can tell you speak from experience because this is, of course, very, very challenging, right? And so, but the, uh, so a, a big part of my training course is helping people, uh, you know, with, with behavior change, which, you know, it's obviously quite difficult for human beings to change behavior, especially eating behavior. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of motivational interviewing and relapse prevention strategies and those sorts of things. But I will also say, and so any diet is hard to stick to long term, right? But I would also say that this diet, uh, strangely enough, is easier to stick to for a lot of my patients than other diets they've tried in the past. And, and there are several reasons for that. So one is that when you shift your metabolism in this way, um, you can go safely and comfortably for much longer periods of time between meals without getting hungry. Because you're able to, your insulin levels are low enough that, you think that that fat burning turns on, and you dip into your fat stores in between meals, and you're able to to sustain your uh, yourself between meals for for very, often quite very long periods of time. So people aren't as preoccupied with food. So that's one thing. 
Another thing is that people feel much better. Most people, and this is the beauty of working this way, most people have never experienced this state of mind before because they've been relying on carbohydrates as their primary fuel source since they were young. And it's just a, a completely different state of mind. And when you shift over, when your body and brain make that shift, which it can take a few days to a few weeks, depending on who you are, on the outside, three months, if you really get a tough case, um, then uh, you know, if they feel so much better, a lot of times people uh, don't want to stop the diet because they've never felt this well before. And in fact, in Dr. In Dr. Ian Campbell's pilot study of the of the uh, ketogenic diet and bipolar disorder, one of the questions he was trying to answer uh, was, you know, could people with serious mental illnesses like bipolar disorder adhere to this diet? And, you know, could they deal with, you know, measuring their ketone level, levels every day and staying in ketosis? One of the wonderful things about this diet is that we have a biomarker for whether or not people are following it. If you're on a Mediterranean diet, we don't really know what you're eating. You know, we're listening to what you report, and maybe you're eating those things, and maybe you're not it's really for us to know unless we lock you up in a metabolic ward. But if you're, if you're on a ketogenic diet and you're not, if, if you're in a study on a ketogenic diet and you're not in ketosis, you're not on the diet. So if, if you're following the diet, you'll be in ketosis. And, and, it's, and, and we can follow these levels remotely uh, using, using wearables. And so, um, uh, so in any case, um, in his study, one of the fascinating things that happened was that there were, I can't remember the percentage off the top of my head, but, the, but there was a certain period at, uh, at a certain point in the study where um, as part of the protocol, patients were supposed to stop the diet. And many of them refused to do so. Because they were feeling so well. <laughs> wow, wow. So, so do you do? They would um, monitor through what gl- uh, glucose monitoring, and do they monitor ketone levels and things like that? Is that how they help people kind of stick to it too? Yes, exactly. So, um, glucose monitoring uh, can can serve a purpose. It's, it's but, but even more important is, is ketone levels. And so, uh, you know, because and we're still there's a lot more research that needs to to happen before we can be clear about what the therapeutic range of ketosis that is you know, most likely to benefit most people with a particular condition, if there even is such a, such a thing, um, uh, what, you know, whether, you know, how, whether the depth of ketosis matters for every condition and for every person. Uh, but in, in my clinical practice, I find that you know, ketone levels, blood ketone levels, which is ketones meaning uh, circulating beta-hydroxybutyrate, particular type of ketone is very stable in the blood, that that... Um, the beta hydroxybutyrate level somewhere between one or 1.2, 1.5, and three millimole. Some above 1.1.0 millimole seems to be when we start to see a lot of the benefits occur for for a lot of patients. Not everybody. Some people don't need that level. Some people need higher levels. But um, yes, yeah, so you, you can monitor blood ketone levels with a blood a finger stick um, meter, and and soon on the horizon will be continuous ketone monitors, which will be lovely. Mm-hmm. Um, but right now it's finger stick monitoring, and there are you know there are, there are apps and platforms that allow uh, researchers and clinicians to you know to log on and see what their patients' ketone levels are. Um, so that's a, that's a lovely. Um, a, a lovely uh, tool to be able to help us understand and help people troubleshoot. You know, so if I see one of my patients has fallen out of ketosis and they're not feeling well, then I can, you know, I can help them troubleshoot that, that with them. And it sort of, you know, fosters a sense of curiosity about the, the root causes of their symptoms. I mean, a lot of people, you know, for years have thought of their symptoms as, well, this is all about my childhood and there's nothing I can do about that or maybe I'll be in you know, therapy for many years, or maybe maybe there's some permanent damage from the trauma, and maybe maybe that's what's wrong, or maybe there's some mysterious chemical imbalance or genetic vulnerability that I can't do anything about. It's going to require lifelong medication, and all of those things may be factors, but for a lot of people, it's a brand new way to think about things. To 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 think about well, maybe my symptoms have a potentially reversible metabolic explanation and it's just uh, the paradigm shift is just wonderful <laughs> yeah i mean i suppose that's where the the education comes into play because all the things that you mentioned previously you know trauma and and genetics and uh, and uh, neurotransmitter disturbances and all those factors are believed to kind of be the drivers of mental health disturbances and then you're talking about diet and you're talking about 
uh, the foods we eat and and that potentially being a major driver or contributor to the mental health disturbances people are experiencing. So th- there needs to be a lot of education with the patients. And I suspect you work with the families too because they're also potentially ones that either can support or sabotage the client's efforts in making changes in their diet. So do you work with families? Oh, all the time. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult in a lot of these cases to work without the family. <laughs> and so, and, so yep. and it makes the course much easier um, if instead of having an identified patient in the home who's changing their diet, for everyone in the family to make some healthy changes to, to their diets as well, um, because it really... Whether they actually follow a ketogenic diet or not is, of course, you know, um, may or may not be necessary. And some families do. Some family members do adopt a ketogenic diet in solidarity with their loved one. Um, but not everybody will. But I do encourage family members to at least keep the foods that are going to be most likely tempting to their family member out of sight or out of the home and mm-hmm. to adopt some healthy changes themselves to uh, be a, to be a role model and and also for their own health, and so and even if it's not ketogenic, you know, sort of like I was saying in the in the book, there's a there's a level one that people can engage with uh, to the degree they feel they can of just cleaning up, the, kind of re fundamentally restructuring their diet from the ground up, even if they are eating lots of carbohydrate, but to eat the healthy carbohydrates and to make sure they're getting the right kinds of protein and avoiding the foods that are most that are, that are riskiest to the brain. Mm-hmm. I mean, that would serve everybody well. I mean, the, 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 uh, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, I mean, obviously for practitioners um, who are recommending dietary changes and, and whether that be ketogenic diets, or, um, which, you know, certainly we're talking about today but it's not just about knowing the foods and and um and ketones and and all those things that are really important for practitioners to know about but it's also really important to know about how you're going to support your clients in implementing the changes and you you mentioned motivational interviewing um there was you know working with families there's you know working, doing some relapse prevention, uh, problem solving, different scenarios, different situations, how we're going to manage uh, dietary changes in, in different situations. I think they're all conversations that need to happen, I think. And, you know, they're the things that practitioners really need to spend time with their clients to discuss uh, because ultimately it's, it's not just the diet. It's about ensuring that the diet is is implemented and and because this is not something that you can just do for two or four weeks and then you can go back to a normal standard American diet. Is That's correct, right? Well, you could, but you want to... <laughs> yeah, you relapse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to clarify that. You could, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and this is it. You, you, I mean, can the insulin resistance go? Can you just like, okay, you, you've been on it for six months, okay, so now you're, you're now more insulin sensitive and... You could relax and um, go back to your old ways and not relapse, or or are you st- is this something that you just got to really continue t- to strictly stick to for the rest of your life? Oh, such a good question. So there are two answers to that question. So one is, can you put insulin resistance into remission and reverse it? You absolutely can. Uh, can you go back to your old ways and remain healthy and metabolically healthy? No. <laughs> but um, the, the other question that's wrapped up in your question is. Uh, is can, uh, after you've been on a ketogenic diet for a certain length of time, will enough healing have taken place in the brain and, and body and metabolism for you to be able to loosen things up and remain well? And we do see that possible. We do see that happen. Uh, and when I say we, I, I don't mean me. <laughs> I mean uh, the, the field, uh, especially the, the uh, field of epilepsy. You know, for over a hundred years now, ketogenic diets have been used successfully, quite successfully in children with, and even adults with a treatment refractory epilepsy. Um, that's how the, the diet was originally designed to stabilize brain chemistry in children with pediatric epilepsy uh, before uh, the availability of useful anti-seizure medications came along. And so in those cases, we often will see um, that children can come off the diet after a year or two and remain seizure-free. Now, in adults no. who are far less metabolically flexible, I don't see that very often in my patients. So I've definitely had a few patients over the years 
who have been able to loosen up their diet around the edges and have more flexibility in their choices um, uh, and, and remain well. Um, my metabolically healthier patients, my more physically fit patients, my patients who are just generally healthier. But most of my patients, unfortunately, um, their symptoms come roaring back within 24, 48 hours of stopping the diet. Okay. Okay. So something really that for adults, they certainly need to continue with. So, all right. Well, I mean, look, I, I've just finished reading your book um, and it's a, it's a great book. Uh, so I really encourage people. I mean, there's lots of questions I would love to ask you and we could continue to go forever, <laughs> but um, uh, a lot of it is covered in your book. And obviously you talk about um, testing options too and, and different options that people have av- we have available in terms of testing. Uh, and then you, you obviously talk about the different uh, more information about the the different forms of the diet, the the paleo diet and the and the keto diet and so forth. So I really encourage people to read the book. It's a, it's a brilliant read, and I I'm really excited. I think that it's something that we really need to do more research on to confirm its its efficacy, its safety, and also you know I, I'm interested in you know how how we can ensure that people do stick to it and and and. Uh, is it something that's implementable with people who are experiencing severe depression or experiencing bipolar disorder or even children? You know, are they able to? So I'd love to see that research accumulate and sound, certainly sounds like the interest is absolutely increasing. It, it really is. I mean, I think, you know, uh, both, both cl- clinicians and researchers are excited about it as well as patients and families. And as you know, the treatments that we have to offer people uh, up until this point, have been have been, well, let's just say disappointing. <laughs> and so, we do need new strategy, new approaches for people, and um, that at least that people could be introduced to from the beginning as an option uh, for people to learn about. The reason I wrote the book was, you know, for clinicians and families and and individuals who are struggling with mental health issues. Um, it, uh, trying to reach all of those groups, hopefully. What's happening is that patients are going to the clinicians and saying, will you help me get onto a ketogenic diet? I'd like to improve my symptoms. And a lot of clinicians don't have the tools or the confidence, you know, to be able to, to do this. And you know, I think at the very least, um, you know, uh, is, is to at least start with a very simple metabolic evaluation to be included in the initial evaluation. Just to look at the person's metabolic health, which can be done with, like you said, a very few simple tests that are listed in the book that that um, uh, are easy to obtain. But just sort of, uh, and, and, you know, even even if it's not a ketogenic diet, but to include some nutrition counseling as part of the you know, overall uh, treatment plan for everyone Absolutely. to help them understand mm-hmm. how important it is, how, how much the brain cares about what we eat. I mean, certainly, thank you, uh, Dr. Reid, for the for the book um, and and for some of the work that you're doing. I know that um, you know, as I said, I've just finished reading the book and I, I, I've got highlights throughout the whole thing. Um, <laughs> so it's just sort of, it originally started off a white cover. Now it's full of uh, yellow highlighted marks all over it. But um, uh, so I hope you don't mind me. Uh, Wrecking it like that, but um, but certainly it's there's lots of great information in there. There's there's chapters in there that are really useful. There are practical chapters there that um, people can read and and refer back to in terms of being able to implement the diet. So I thank you for that. And you've also got a website that people can refer to and um, and learn more about some of your work. Yeah. So the website is called diagnosisdiet.com, and so there's information mm-hmm. about the book there, but there's also information about the training program there, and 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 perhaps most importantly, there's a free clinician directory tab. Should you click on the directory to clinician directory tab on the website? So if you're looking for other, you know, if you're a patient out there who's looking for a clinician, you, know, you can look there. It's, a free, it's free to search. It's international. Uh, we're trying to grow it every day. Um, and it's free if you are a practitioner who already practices this way. It's free to list your practice there. 
um, we're trying to make you know improve access to these kinds of services. So, um, and there are clinicians of all backgrounds there who work specifically using ketogenic diets specifically to treat mental health conditions. So it's, it's um, very special directory in that way. So I hope that's useful to people, and I, I really appreciate the, the fantastic, very thoughtful questions, um, and and again the ability to connect with, with your with your practitioners. I hope it's useful. Yeah, no, definitely. I'm sure that uh, lots of people will be referring back to your website and to your book. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. So thank you, everyone, for listening today. Uh, Don't forget that you can find all the show notes, the transcripts and other resources for today's episode on the FX Medicine website. I'm Dr. Adrian Lopresti, and thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only, and it is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to FX Medicine, and share us with your family, friends, and colleagues.